Welcome to Playwrights Roundtable, our half-hour showcase of one-act plays produced locally by Playwrights Roundtable, the organization. And today we're going to watch A Quest for Kotex, the play written by Alfred Gandhi and directed by Jamie Klein. So we'll have a conversation about the play right after we watch it. Everybody sit back and relax and enjoy A Quest for Kotex. Industrial Fembot 3000 insertable prelude pads. I am warning you, I'll ask my mother to come live with us. Gross. Okay, uh, paper, paper, I need paper. Um. Ultra Fem 3000. What kind of beer do you want? Go now, get moving. Fumble. Good evening, most excellent customer of convenience. What have you selected this evening? A mode of usual stuff, and one of these. One tropical fruit delicious Slurpee, $1.79. Beer of lightness, $8.99. Snickers, that which contains snack deliciousness, $1.99. Okay, sir, I, I must scan your licorice product with my laser. 99 cents of licorice. So, Saturday at 4 at Pam's place, bring a guy and a stupid guy story. We'll put the boys in the rec room and have a ball making fun of them. Can I get a copy of, uh, that? Yeah, me too. Fighting the curse and missing the game. Talk at you soon. One color glassy photo book of girly girly hotness. $5.95, a most excellent choice. Do you require any other of my fine wear, sir? Uh, scratch and snip ticket, a premium gasoline additive. Mm -hmm. Oh, I almost, I almost forgot. Something um, personal. <laughs> uh, birth prevention devices are on aisle three. Oh. Candy flavored goodness. No, 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 no. She needs. Oh, my goodness graciousness. Why did you not say so in the first place? Then I wish to direct you to the section of feminist androgynous products on aisle four. You go past the kitty litter, turn left at the paper towels, and stop when you see the ragu spaghetti sauce. You have my deepest sympathiness. Thanks, Modi. Keep an eye on my stuff. I'll be right back. Um, excuse me. Do you by any chance see feminist uh, 3000 products? Excuse me? I'm looking for... For my feminist stuff, 3,000. Are you trying to pick me up? Ew, ew, oh, with those? Ew, no, no. You consider that a pickup line? It's vulnerable yet clever. No, I'm, I'm looking for 
these. Did you write this with a Cheeto? I need a hint. Girly stuff, you know. The Ultra Industrial Fenbot 3000 insertable pre-loop pads are normally right here. I don't see any. I just got the last one. No! Go fish, they've got paper towels over there. No, 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 you don't understand. If I don't get the right thing, she might, she might move her mother into the spare room. How horrible. You should have gotten here sooner. Ugh. Yes. No. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. No. Um, the, the convenience store. I just missed getting the last box. Some woman beat me to him. Does she use anything else? Talk to her. Ugh. About what? No. I know. I bet because she has. Because I can't buy the three thousands, I can get by with a box of these. I'll call you back. It's sweet you made the special trip for her. So. Hi. Hi. If there is one thing that my wife really enjoys, it is the feel of the I'll bet she does. Open. Well, I'm gonna go home, pop one in myself, and catch the end of that game. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, you care to make a wager on that game? It wouldn't involve a 12 pack of 3000s, would it? Maybe. Here's a better idea. You've seen the mascot do his dance after a touchdown? Sure, lots of times. You strip down to your skivvies and do the dance, and these are yours. No, no way, uh -uh. Nice to meet you, gotta run, there's a big game on. Hey, get those back! I got them, honey, I'm coming home! Stop, see, those are mine! Finders keepers! Ugh. Ugh. People, people, you must respect my calmness. Now behave respectably. That is my box of feminine unmentionableness until it is paid for. I'll just be taking these. Is it not that of the gentleman on the floor? He seemed pained. Ring me up. Very well. But he is partly paid for. I'm, I must close him out before I can close you. What if I just... I should just... Please? Then dance. In your underwear? He will not reveal his nakedness in a community standards offending way, will he? Touchdown, big boy. They're yours. Have fun. And a box of mysteries, $5.99. Your total is $25.79. I only have 20. Then something must go back on the shelf. No, oh, your backwash contaminates its tropicalness. You've already digested more than my cost. And now you spill your Slurpee on the magazine. Sticky magazines cannot be sold. The box of feminine hygiene Nazi Nazis would bring you into reconciliation. Modi, you've met her mother. Goodness, yes. You're left with but one option. Well, Modi, I I'm in here three times a week. Cut me some slack. Checks are accepted. With driver's license, three major credit cards, and AAA card. If I had a major credit card, I'd use it. Precisely. Is that your answer of finality? What if I just got a six pack of beer? Keep the beer. Your wise decision. Carly and Ganesh both approve. Honey, I'm home. You forgot, didn't you? Forgot what? Bartram King, too little. Just kidding. Here they are. Oh, oh! Thank God for absorption. things where women pass around booties and say, isn't this just darling? It's not that bad. They have a giant plasma TV in the rec room. It's embarrassing to go to those things no matter how big the TV is. Is that the most embarrassing thing you've ever done? 
I guess not. Who's Franny? You like her. She rides a Harley, kickboxes, and uh, she dyed her hair pink. Really? She wants us to tell stupid guy stories. Won't that be fun? <laughs> He had quite the adventure, didn't he? Al, you've always got a wacky one. And Jamie, what was it like to direct this? So stay tuned. After this short intermission, we're going to have a conversation about a quest for Kotex. If you don't come back with a box of Ultra Industrial Fembot 3000 insertable prelude pads, I will put your head through that TV. It is that time of the month there's no jury in the world that could convict me. <clears throat> Honey, I'm going to the store for beer. You need anything? Ultra Industrial Fembot 3000 insertable prelude pads. I am warning you, I'll ask my mother to come live with us. Gross. You've just watched another quick clip from Quest for Kotex, a play written by Al Pergandi and directed by Jamie Klein. Welcome to the studio, gentlemen. We're so happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's start with it. Al, this was an adventure, a quest, and an, an, and an, a humiliation, really. <laughs> well, it was. It was. Uh, but let me explain the humiliation part. This, this play was basically uh, written after I wrote, read a book about the hero's journey, and I decided to try and write a little hero's journey for a 10 minute piece and I had to give my uh, my hero, that's a Bert, I had to give him uh, something to go off and do and anybody, you can take any random guy and you say go find a magic ring, here's a magic sword, they're gonna go do it and it's it's sort of, uh, it's a guy thing so I said I want to give this guy a quest that he really doesn't want to do and I thought what's the thing that nobody wants to do, no guy wants to do and that's buy feminine products. <laughs> So all the little elements of, of the hero's journeys are there. There's the call. There's the refusal of the call. There's the uh, you know the, the the threshold guardian. That's the uh, Modi, the, the the shop owner. Uh, there's the battle in the innermost cave. There's the the stealing of the the stealing of the elixir. That's when he steals the box. There's the the magic flight when he's he's being chased and he has to he has to you know battle off. Uh, uh, the the attacker and and he eventually comes back to the ordinary world the world of of his football game and what he's done besides bring back a a, a boon a prize he's he has grown himself and he now is able to to take this this new problem which is this baby shower he has to attend and it's not the worst thing anymore he's been through worse he's he's a, he's grown as a as a guy and and that's sort of what I was aiming for here a quest. It was an epic telling, Al. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> now, a lot of the character per, uh, personalities were a little bit stereotyped. I mean, we have the, the wife who's demanding. It's that time of the month, and she's hostile and angry. And, and then we have the, the grocery store uh, manager or the, the checkout guy. Checkout guy, yeah. Checkout guy, and a little bit of stereotypes, st some stereotypes there. Yeah, and, and, and that was to a certain extent intentional because I wanted to focus on, on the story elements and not try and complicate it. A lot of, a lot of movies, um, famous movies, everybody is basically an archetype or stereotype, and they play to that, and, and people seem to have no problem with that. I was, you know, a little nervous about about Modi. I didn't want to make him offensive or anything like that, but I, I did like that uh, that sort of musicality of people who, who uh, work in these stores, and, and I, I tried to catch that, catch that 
and give him a, a voice where he sounded distinct and he so he speaks in sentences that are a little bit backwards and he, he says funny things he confuses his adverbs and adjectives quite a bit the box of feminine hygiene nazi nazis would bring you into reconciliation Modi you've met her mother goodness yes you're left with but one option Modi I, I'm in here three times a week cut me some slack checks are accepted with driver's license, three major credit cards, and AAA card. If I had a major credit card, I'd use it. Precisely. Is that your answer of finality? <laughs> Jamie, you were drawn to this play. What made you uh, select it as, as your choice for directing this go-round? Well, I uh, had been given the opportunity by Alan Chuck to direct any piece, and uh, I was pretty open, and they said, well, I would like you to direct this piece, um, and we've worked in the past, not on anything specific, but we've had dealings in performance and playwriting and whatnot, um, and I really liked the piece. It had a lot of fun quips to it, and the characters were nice, and plus it had four actors as opposed to a million, so it was nice and easy to get people together, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just really nice, fun, simple, but yet, uh, it's still some meat to it, obviously. Yeah. Now, there's essentially three scenes mm -hmm. in this, and uh, a, a lot of blocking involved. Yes. Tell me about some of the uh, the inner workings of getting this to from the living room to the grocery store to the the, the fight, the running around the the aisle. How was that for you? Well, um, first off, you know we're directing in a very low budget setting obviously so finding spaces to do all this is very hard um, and uh, we were fortunate enough that Samantha she was the woman who played uh, uh, Samantha Elkins she played the lady that came in Fanny and she actually had a nice large living room so we were able to use that plus it had mirrors so they were able to see themselves and get self-conscious about everything they did um, so what we were able to find is that in the journey, you know, you actually, we need to have them physically move. And plus, being a 10 minute piece, 13 minute piece, you don't want to sit there and be, have this set and then the people, stagehands come out, move that, and then bring in the store. So we found it was more fun to be able to have a movement around the stage and bring them from the home to the store. The other reason that we actually had that choice for actually separating the stage into, into pieces as opposed to clearing it and bringing in a new set was also originally uh, for the fight sequence, which ended up being nice, easy, short for various reasons. Uh, but the original idea was to have this big, long, out, long drawn out battle uh, between Fanny and Bert. And it was going to go through the audience. It was going to go out into the uh, out into the foyer and around backstage, and you just hear noises and crashes and booms. And so, and we one of the ideas that I had wanted to do was that as it leaves into the audience, it would then go back through the home. So then we have two different areas, and then so they're fighting at home, and then finally back in the store. So it was really nice to be able to use that. Unfortunately due to constraints, we didn't go with that. But, you know, simple is better sometimes. And there are a lot of constraints in a one-act play, aren't there? There are. Uh, you've got to hit the ground running. You've got to figure out what you're going to do. You need to get the situation and the characters established literally within a line or two. Um, five pages of determining that the guy is a, you know, is a, is a steel worker or something. People will write that, but you just don't have that time. So you've got to you've got to move right along and get to your get to your end point as quickly as possible. Um, I do try and write things when they're ten minutes. They do hopefully come out at ten minutes and staging or no staging. And I read them and and we read them at PRT and, and time them. Uh, and then we turn directors loose and hopefully the time comes out pretty much the same. I haven't actually timed this one yet. Uh, I'll, I'll do that at some point. Here. We'll time it. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> You'll know by the time this show yeah. ends. <laughs> now tell me the selection of the actors. They're, they were all, they, they did their parts so well. And tell me <laughs> about the selection process. Um, well, I, when I had been brought in, I unfortunately had not been able to sit in on the auditions at the time because mm -hmm. schedules not allowing and not permitting. Um, but Al and Chuck were both there, and um, or at least Chuck was Chuck there. Was there. Chuck okay. was there, and um, they had actors that they had sent to me and said these guys read very well for certain parts, 
and me not knowing a lot of the actors that they had come in with, I, I love to work with people that I don't know, but given that this was a very short time period to rehearse this show, I also wanted to work with people that I knew I had a rapport with, would understand my direction, and be able to hit the ground running, basically. So I was very fortunate. Two of the actors are uh, performers that I've had the pleasure of working with in some capacity um, in my past. And then Modi, uh, that's Andrew Hakimapur, and Samantha Elkins, who played Fanny. Uh, those two came to me through the audition process uh, by recommendation. And so I was able to bring the four of them in. And uh, fortunately enough, uh, as a director, I feel that the majority of the strength that lies in a director is in the casting. That's where a lot of power lies because mm -hmm. if you if you pick a, a good cast that clicks like these guys did, then it makes your life so much easier. <laughs> and uh, and these guys really clicked immediately first rehearsal. The trouble that I had actually was landing a Bert. Um, I knew I wanted to go with someone I knew for that. Mm -hmm. um, so the first actor that I had picked. He took a few days to get back to me, and finally, once he got back to me, and I was already sh doing rehearsals with my three other actors, he came back and said, I can't do it, got commitments. And I'm like, okay. Mm. So then I went through two other actors who both also ended up having commitments, finally landed on Scott Browning. Um, it was more of an epiphany moment. I, sh I should have thought of him in the first place, but uh, great, great talented actor. He's uh, come in and out of many things in art's sake and done at the Fringe Festival. And uh, so it worked out very well. Um, excuse me. Do you by any chance see feminist uh, three thousand? Excuse me. I'm looking for for my feminist stuff. Three thousand. Are you trying to pick me up? Ew. Ew. Oh, with those? Ew. No. No. You consider that a pickup line? It's vulnerable yet clever. Now, Al, I know you've had plenty of experience with this, uh, watching your plays and, and writing them, seeing the audience reaction. This one had a lot of animation to it. What was some of the feedback you got? Uh, I, I, nothing but positive feedback, and it really, it really looked a great deal like I imagined it when I was writing it. Um, we set uh, in the in the actual theater. We actually set Bert in the audience in one mm. of the chairs in, in theater downtown. Here. Which I caught. That was very clever. Yeah. So <laughs> he looked. He just looked like some guy sitting there drinking a beer, eating chips uh, when people came in. We were the second show, and so he just you know brought the sound up and he starts acting and people are like, oh, there's an actor amongst us. Mm -hmm. So uh, it it it's been uh, it's been a very good uh, a very good process. This has been very successful, I think. What about you, Jamie? I know that you've done a. a couple of things with playwrights before. How was this experience um, rewarding for you? I felt this was my strongest uh, showing directorially uh, yet with Playwrights Roundtable. I had the fortune of directing a show a while back uh, with them and that went very well and the actors were very, very strong. Um, but this was a uh, four-person cast as opposed to a two-person cast which I had done with and time constraints were very limited. So um, when I was able to get in with my actors and still have enough time to be able to go through the actor's process. Uh, for example, with Andrew, um, I, we had talked about the stereotypes of the characters, and I didn't want to come off as offensive, so we actually came up with a few different ideas for him. And uh, this is one of the strongest points, I thought, is that we were able to still have time. For example, as I was saying with Andrew, he was able to go through uh, like a surfer slacker type of character to, to, run, the, to run the convenience store. Uh, he had a conservative up type, tight, uh, type of character that he played with. And he was able to bring all of those together. And as Al had said earlier, with the musicality and tonality of that speech pattern mm -hmm. that he ultimately used, uh, I still wanted him to go there but he was able to draw so much else in, and that's just like a microcosm of an explanation as for how it worked with all the other actors. Mm -hmm. And even though it was, like I said, a short rehearsal period, they still were able to very much delve into a lot of the actor's process and come out on top for the hero's journey. <laughs> Al, what's the uh, Playwrights, the Playwrights Roundtable experience? Well, it's a, it's a small uh, local group, and most everybody knows everybody else, and we get together once a month and uh, read, read things to each other um, and make comments on it. And it's a, it's a very professional collegiate atmosphere, so you're not getting 
people who who don't know what the, what the process is. Uh, so you do get uh, you do get helpful feedback, um, and you can take that feedback and act on it or ignore it as as you see fit. That's always your call. Uh, but it's uh, it's very helpful in in finding out what works and what doesn't work. And and sometimes it's not even hearing what people say. It's just watching them react while you're reading it. Do they laugh? You know, do they laugh when they're supposed to laugh? Do they start, you know, picking their fingernails, which indicates they're bored, or start, you know, checking their cell phone, which is another great indicator of boredom in today's society. Uh, so it's a, it's a great way if, if, if you've got something that you've written, uh, it's a way to see if it has merit or if it needs work without, without the expense and, and troubles of, of going for the full production and, and dealing with all the financial aspects of that. I enjoyed Quest for Kotex. I think the both of you really came up with a very good piece. It was very engaging but hilarious. And there were, to me, it was, it was a, an adventure. I know it's a (laughs) quest, but for a man, I can imagine what and what an adventure. And the odd odd thing is, is guys have less trouble buying pantyhose or nylons than they do buying feminine products. products. It's it's just an odd (laughs) thing, and I don't. The actresses in the show both were like, "I would never make my boyfriend ever do that." And there are probably some women in the audience that felt the (laughs) same way, but that that's what made it so funny. Yes, it's a very personal. It's a very personal. Whether you're a guy or a girl, dealing with this is a very personal thing, and, and that's part of part of what's going on. Thank you very much for sharing this journey with us. Well, thank you for helping us go on it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Playwrights Roundtable. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Playwrights Roundtable provides opportunities for authors to have their work read by professional actors. Members of Playwrights Roundtable have seen their works go from cold readings to workshop productions and on to successful full productions. If you love the craft, Playwrights Roundtable is the place. For more information, contact Playwrights Roundtable at 407 788 8468 or check out the website www.playwrightsroundtable.org